Um, okay, so this is quantifying the true business value of DevOps. And I am Ronald. This is Adrian. Hi. And you did not drink too much last night, or maybe you did, but the screen really is jittering a little. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, if you have any questions, given that we're two and we're going to be checking Twitter, uh, just tag them DevOps Biz. Uh, so Adrian and I work for BlueSpark. BlueSpark is a distributed company um, that's a good chunk of Blue Spark at Austin, um, and Dr Drupal Cons is usually where most of us meet. And we do, we're a, a Drupal shop, like I guess most of us here are, um, and we do websites for various clients. Uh, in addition, and to a certain extent, why DevOps is really interesting for, for us from a number of different perspectives, we also work on uh, a product, which is Roomify, which launched last week, actually, with like its first offering. And if you do anything with travel, hotels, you'll be interested in this. Roomify.us, check it out. Uh, so we do a product, and we have to worry about how we get changes and we launch new versions of that product, and how we get to market quicker. And we also manage a magazine, like an online magazine, which has its own set of challenges. So when we think about DevOps, we, we think about it from a number of different perspectives. What can we do for our clients? What do they need us to do? Uh, what can we do for product development? And what, what can we do for kind of an online um, site that you know, we, we run entirely and we need to worry about all its different aspects. So the, kind of, uh, the main objective of this presentation is hopefully to start a debate about what's the best way to convince non-developers that DevOps is something to invest in. I think we, we all largely agree that this is a good thing. And we'll talk about what exactly we mean when we think about uh, uh, dev operations. Um, but how do you go to business and say, look, this is a good thing because, and it's not because there's some cool tool or something really exciting technologically because it's going to change something for the business. Okay, so before we, we get into that, let's just briefly talk about what, what is uh, DevOps. Um, and very quickly, DevOps is essentially the realization that, at least the way I understand it, that nothing is done in isolation, right? So any uh, part of software development relates at some point to something else, and unless we start seeing all the different parts together and how they connect, it's not going to be an efficient flow from design, user experience, all the way to actually releasing it into the world. And the, the, the great thing is that this is something that other disciplines have had to come to terms with and deal with a um, long time ago, especially manufacturing. And there's a, there's a great book called The Phoenix Project. How many have read that book? Look it up. It's, it's a bizarre <laughs> book because it's, um, it talks about dev operations, but it's, it's written from the perspective of just this guy that wakes up at home and has a wife and kids and needs to go to work and there's the politics of work going on. And it's just, it's literature, right? It's a story. But it's a story that only um, developers will get because then it becomes quite technical. So it's, it's this weird mixture where you're, you're reading an actual book, like literature, narrative, but it's very technical. And it's a great way to get across uh, what the problems are, what the issues, challenges, and how they fix them. Um, and one of the main points that the, the Phoenix Project brings up is that you need to look at other disciplines. They talk about manufacturing, so think of 
uh, that process as going from one um, uh, type of discipline onto to another, and they need to interact, and they need to think through where the bottlenecks are, and then it, it describes how they, they solve all of that. Um, okay, so that, from a very high-level perspective, is what um, how we think about uh, DevOps. Now, Adrian is going to talk a bit more about the specifics and how we break that into uh, layers, uh, and then we'll talk about the analysis with it. So, pass it on. And so, we were thinking about this and thinking, what really are the different parts of DevOps? How do you segment this and how do you break it down so that you can analyze it? And so we're just trying to give you the background for what we're actually talking about when we're talking about putting some sort of framework together to quantify what DevOps gives you, what it saves you. And so we found it's helpful to break it down into chunks, but it's also about realizing that it's not just, oh, we do DevOps at this shop, or we don't do DevOps, it's too hard, it's too time consuming, expensive, or whatever. But how much DevOps do we do now? in a month, in a year. And so <clears throat> sort of the first phase is literally the basics which you build upon. And that's what we're calling create your world. And that's the things using tools like configuration management. And we don't get into specific tools in this talk. It's, um, it's almost missing the point in getting into debates about what's best. But it's just about let's use a tool. Um, and so if we're automating things, you have a lot of benefits. You're, um, you've got happy developers. They're not sitting there and logging in, drush up, you know, get pull, the rest of it. And so you've got a stable, a repeatable, you might even say Eden potent base upon which the rest can be built. And so the next place we go is monitoring. And that's really just knowing what's going on. And having effective monitoring really can uh, prevent a lot of embarrassment in your life. Um, don't ask me how I know. <laughs> but anyway, it really is hugely important. And effective monitoring is even more so. It's great to have tons of notifications when you know, your server loads over two. But it sort of all gets into a big wash of data and isn't useful. And you end up losing sleep and getting mad and just shutting down Nagios. <coughs> which isn't really helpful. So there are two big pieces to talk about. One is notifications for things you need to know about and you need to know about right now. Um, if you know what's going on, then you can <laughs> save a bad situation before the rest of the world knows about it. And then the second is to make sense of the huge amount of data an application can spit out. And there are a ton of tools that exist now that were really just getting started or did not exist eight or 10 years ago. And it's um, really great to have things like Splunk and Graylog and things like that that let you quickly distill down and you're not sitting here writing shell scripts to figure out what the hell happened last night. And, um, you know, it's, it's almost unfair to group the latter with the former, but it's all of a piece with knowing what your application, application is doing right now and why it's doing it. So the next thing we're talking about, we've created the world, and we've, we're monitoring it, we know what's going on. And so now we're going to try and improve it. And so you know, you've done a lot of hard work to define your world, uh, to create it rather, to define the environment, the OS, the stack parameters, the logging, and so many more things. But if it's just in one place, then you've got to redo that work each time you're going somewhere else. And so it's really about uh, using a provisioning tools and being able to know that, okay, my development environment, other than perhaps logging parameters, matches my staging environment, which other than perhaps content matches my production environment. I can make a change one place and know that it's going to work everywhere. And so it, it will save you time and money if you get it right. And um, by the way, some of these quotes that we are seeing on the slides are coming from a survey we sent out and greatly appreciate the responses uh, if, if any of you are here that did that. So the next thing is testing. I think the, the image is a bit current. I think everyone knows what kind of phone that is. 
And it's, it's really important to know things like this before you, say, spend trillions of dollars to uh, push them out into the world. And so we've got an awesome environment. We're monitoring it carefully. We can deploy it to data centers worldwide at the touch of a button, maybe even while drinking a beer. But does it really matter, any of it, if the application itself is utter crap? And so I actually come from the sysadmin side, from the ops side of this originally. I'm going to put on my old sysadmin hat and say, nope, server's still up. My job's done. <laughs> you know, you guys need to fix your application. But hang on a minute. That's not how we do things anymore. That's the whole point of DevOps, right? We're breaking down the silos. We're working in a team. And so it's not time right now to pop the top and catch up on the latest bastard operator from hell column. The job has just begun. And so testing, it's really, it's a whole world unto itself. We're not going to get into details or start a war over which and, uh, test suite is the best or how to do testing. But it's just, I'll just say a couple of things. And one is that any test is better than no test. Uh, that's... Um, Howard yesterday was giving a pr presentation on the culture of DevOps, and he was saying, if you take one thing away from this session yesterday, he said, just write a test, any test, get started. And that's like literally the most valuable thing you can do. And uh, one of the biggest benefits is not even a completely quantifiable thing in our experience, but it's that it really makes clients feel good about what you're doing, the development that you're doing, your application. And mistakes and bugs happen. People understand that. But if you can say, look, we didn't anticipate this. We're human. But we wrote a test. And this one is not going to happen again. It really, it's, uh, um, it's emotionally pretty big to people in our experience. And so moving on, then um, just talking about scaling. And it's not just the sort of slash dot effect idea that if all of a sudden your site goes viral and you've got thousands of hits per second instead of per hour or day that you can survive it. But it's about right sizing your world, right? That the resources in use are going to match your application's needs and then it'll happen automatically. You don't have to go in and make it happen or <laughs> forget to scale to turn off four servers after the big event and get hit with a you know a thousand euro hosting bill a month later and so the benefits should be pretty obvious to most if not all it's little things like cost savings and you know not having the site go down slightly important and so the final phase and um, we've sort of had fixed six phases and that's security and the biggest thing here, our takeaway, is that with consistent environments, you're, you're going to be able to react with assurance. If you know that your environments match each other, then you can add and test a patch with confidence. You're not trying to do this in production and hope there's not uh, you know, a chain reaction that takes everything down. And um, once you've done the work once, you're close to done. You didn't have to write down the steps because you've got you, you know, your code as documentation. And so that, those are the phases of DevOps. And so we've talked about the implementation, obviously in a sort of vague do it kind of way, not in, we're not going to do live demos and things like that. But we're going to zoom even further out and discuss a little bit about our philosophy of DevOps. And this isn't, you know, the only way, they're the only way to think about it, but this is what's worked for us and been a useful framework. And so it really gets summed up by what you're looking at now. It's not all or nothing. Um, if you even just do one thing, you're, you've got automated tests running or you've got configuration management going. Now you're an organ organization that have, has DevOps in its culture. And a little really does go a long way. And it's, it's about saying, we're doing this, this is, um, we're an organization that does DevOps, and this is our ideal that it's going to be, you know, uh, holistic. And so along those lines, just go ahead and get started. Don't get overwhelmed by it. Uh, dip your toes in the water. Maybe at the beginning of a, your next project, when the budget decisions are easier, then you're going to say, okay, this is when we install Jenkins. And it's not that you... Feel like you have to have it all to do any of it.
and it's really not about the latest cool tools. It's not, oh, well, first we were on Puppet, but then Chef came out, and that's even better, so we're going to install that. You can have excellent DevOps with a set of Bash scripts, and it's all about what works for your organization and your people. And so you need first the culture change, just the idea that no one's excluded. Um, again, from Howard's presentation yesterday, Howard Tyson, he, had a, he said one thing that I really liked, and he said DevOps is not a department. It's not this old idea of here are the developers and here are the um, operators over here in a silo. And that it's, the idea is that it's, to me what that says is that DevOps is everyone's job. And everyone's contributing even if it's just saying, you know, it would save me half an hour a week if this was automated and getting that started. And so this is wonderful. You know, we've talked about a lot of things. I think probably most of you in the room are on the same page, like this is great, this is wonderful. But you need buy-in, right? Someone's got to pay for this. Um, <laughs> and so in the final analysis, how do we get clients and or leadership to sign off and write the check for time logs that look like grunted with some vagrants for a while or played with puppets or puppet, that could be a real time log, boss chef around, varnish the application. You know, we really have almost like a language and culture disconnect that we're trying to bridge and really um, just get that buy-in and get get the get leadership interested if leadership is especially in larger organizations where leadership is not necessarily close to the developers and operators and so now we're, we're trying to get to what you came for which is how do you relate tasks like this to the something the customer understands and values it's one thing that I think really sticks out to a lot of people and that's time and money and so we have, um, and so making that case for the business of value, uh, um, sorry, the business value of DevOps, then um, we've really seen that increased efficiency lets us focus on quality. Our team really is happier when they're not dealing with minutia on the command line every day. And that really has made our clients happier. Um, And so I really liked this from uh, Greg Madison, who's now at card.com. He's another Coloradan. He says, we're able to provide new features faster and more reliably, and we haven't had a white screen after adding automated tests, uh, after having them about you know, four major events a year before that. And so when we're talking about the benefits for the client, we think about having more robust systems. You can do more to them without being worried that a house of cards going to fall over. Um, you know, time to market, new features, and the uh, increased confidence in the process and your, what you're delivering is what I was talking about earlier. And so they really just, um, we found that this assurance that clients get is not just something that we've experienced. And so, you know, we've, so far we've had some hand waving, we're telling you this is so, but now we're gonna really dive into the figures and because I was a music major, I'm going to let Ron deal with the actual numbers. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so I think we, we, we largely agree DevOps is a good idea. It's something we should be doing. Measuring what you do is very important. And when you have DevOps, which is has all the things that Adrian talked about, which are really very vague uh, and very hard to attach a value to, how can you go to, to management and say, look, we're going to need 100K, 200K invested specifically to set up this infrastructure, to train everyone to use it, when um, the only things that you have to talk about are, are very hand-wavy and there's no direct connection. So we tried to come up with a framework um, that would allow us to quantify some of the gains, like very directly. Now, the problem with that, there's, there's all sorts of problems with this actually, and I shouldn't be saying this <laughs> before presenting the framework, 
But it's, it's very hard because there's so many differences between different organizations. So one organization saving is not going to be the same as another. And the way we deal with that is we try to have some parameters in there so that you can play around with it. Um, but it's a bit like tests. Being able to point to a number and have a number and say this is what we expect the game to be. And then you can argue about how valid that number is and you can move it up or down playing around with the parameters is much better than not having any specific argument. And because we're all doing pretty much the same thing, we're building websites first, we're building Drupal websites in particular, it's actually much more transferable from the experience of one agency to another. So what's our methodology? Um, Adrian talked about the different layers, right? So we have six layers. Um, we're going to try and identify savings that can come across when you implement DevOps in each one of these layers. Um, we're going to allow the model to you know, vary, and we're going to do it across different projects. Um, and we'll see what comes out. That's really the spirit with which we, we started this. Said, okay, let's, let's see what makes sense. Let's see what the numbers tell us. And there's some, some interesting outcomes. Um, so the first layer is creating your world. Now, a, an organization that doesn't use DevOps is um, there could be any number of things it did before. Um, how it looked at BlueSpark is, you know, you'd start by literally figuring out passwords or thinking about well, how do I get my key on this server so that I can actually log in and do things myself. Um, you have to go get the repository from somewhere. You have to figure out where the database is, how you access that. There's all these pieces of information that you needed to collect. And if an organization doesn't have a way to share these pieces of information, it becomes very hard. And especially in our case, we're a distributed organization. You know, maybe I, I live in Italy, so I start in the morning and I do something, and then in the afternoon I'm out, and Adrian is in Colorado. It's like seven hours difference. Yeah. So he wakes up, and I'm already eight. gone. Yeah. Eight hours difference. So unless we have a system sure. whereby we, we hand over <laughs> information, there is, it becomes very difficult, right? So set up a wiki. And yeah, a lot of, if you go to any DevOps session, it's not going to be how to set up a wiki, right? That's not exciting, but that's part of uh, DevOps. You set up a wiki and it has instructions. You've already done something. Um, you can get a bit fancier and have like proper access control, LDAP or whatever, you know, uh, excites you. Uh, what we are moving towards uh, on our projects now is actually having a Vagrant machine that has the entire project there and the only thing a developer has to do is download that definition, run it, and it does everything from them. It will go get the database, it will go get the code, it will set up any permissions, and they can just start coding. So this is where it's going to get complicated. It's, you know, it's advanced math. I hope you'll be able to follow. Uh, so how do you find the cost of this? Right. So there's, there's an upfront cost of defining an environment. Uh, we said before, you, know, you need to create your world. Uh, then you have, so that's like a fixed cost. And then you have how many developers are actually going to work on this project? And how much time is it going to take each developer to set up their environment? So we took three of our projects and pulled some numbers. Um, first project, we have 11 developers. Second one is six. And the third one, although it's a smaller project, actually more developers worked on it. And I should point out, and this is probably, well, I don't know, um, I think it's maybe more specific to BlueSpark. The way we work is people tend to specialize, so they move between projects quite a lot. So rather than having, you know, like, I don't know, two back-end developers and a front-end developer and that's it, we will have project, uh, people move across projects based on what the task is. Uh, because they're the 
the person that can do that the best. Okay, so average time to set up individually, right? This is without DevOps. Uh, it depends on the complexity of the project. The first one, it's, um, there's like language definitions, um, it's multilingual, uh, there's domains to set up, there's uh, Thrush scripts that need to run with cron. So you find if people don't have a consistent environment, they're messing around with just getting it to work. And that's a huge annoyance, but it's, it's inevitable if you have complex sites. People, you know, it's literally half a day, I, yeah, I can now log in. I, what should I do now? And half a day went by. And we all know uh, that that can take place. Um, if, it's, if it's a really simple project, like the last one, it, you know, it's just going to be a case of figuring out where the information is and getting your Drupal site running, and that's it. If you have a Vagar machine, you actually you standardize it across all projects, and really it becomes a question of how quickly can you download things. So the bottleneck is literally your connection. So I'm the slowest person in the company because I live in Sicily, and <laughs> not a good idea if you want to do web development. Did not think that through. Um, there are compensations. Well, yeah. The food is good. The weather is fine. Um, so the savings overall are 46 hours across the three projects, right? And, you know, you can argue about the specifics endlessly. The way we got to these figures is just talking to different developers, knowing what happened because it's projects we worked with, and this is pretty much it. But there is something there that we can point at and say, you know, you're, you're going to have, um, take project A, 32 extra hours to do something else because you implemented DevOps. Well, now you can translate that to money and say, uh, divide that across five different projects uh, of similar size or similar number of devs to onboard, and we, can actually plan to invest that much, right? And this is just on creating our world, just getting set up. We haven't done anything else yet. Monitoring our world. And this is, this is a really um, bad one if you don't have any system in place uh, because it's essentially you have to get onto logs uh, and start grepping around. And you have people like that love it, like Adrian here. He's still, you know, does all sorts of fancy things. And there's people that are like, I don't know. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> and um, usually, you know, if it's very annoying to go check what's going on, you're going to well, you're going to clear cache, right? And hope that's going to fix it. <laughs> And, and then you're going to try various things that have worked in the past, not being sure if they're the right thing or the wrong thing, because you don't actually have any information. But you can do things now, and it's, it's really easy. You just search it, and there's actually a lot that have done it uh, within the Drupal world. You can have proper faceted search of your logs. Um, you can pay for something like a new relic. right? And uh, we'll see the numbers, you can actually go and say, this is why we should be paying, you know, maybe a uh, 1000 or $2,000 a month for New Relic or any similar service. We, um, not really advertising New Relic, although it's, it's very good. Um, <laughs> we use it a lot. No so I'm just, just being honest. Um, okay, so the way we got to a number um, is... We looked at the tickets associated with the different projects and tickets that are uh, set up as, uh, you know, marked as bugs. Then we reduced that number of tickets by what we're calling the misrepresentation miscategorization factor, which also translates to the client doesn't really know what's a bug <laughs> and what's a new feature. Um, and but it, it was kind of an easy way to say, okay, um, and you'll see the numbers. Uh, we don't really have that many bugs. It's an easy way to say this is what probably were the actual issues 
that um, uh, led to us having to dig through logs. And then you multiply by the time it takes to, to dig uh, in logs. Right. So these are the three projects. And I, again, Project A and Project B are, are huge projects with, um, I think, close to 1,000 or more ticketage. Um, so we have, um, we reduced that significantly because that's a better representation of what are actual bugs, although it's probably still not reduced enough to represent um, um, just real bugs, bugs maybe. Um, then you, you, a very uh, kind of um, optimistic time it would take to pinpoint issues. We just said 20 minutes if you don't have a system in place and six minutes if you do. That's really, really optimistic. I think if you don't have a system in place, it's easy to go to an hour, two hours, and so on and so forth. But still, even with this, um, you can see that, again, you get on reasonably sized projects, you get huge savings. That's an extra two weeks of your life to do something interesting as opposed to uh, trawling through logs. What, you don't like said? I do not. <laughs> Um, and again, a number that you can take and say, this is why we should be paying for some service. And it, that's a, we actually, we had this argument with a client, right? And it is a really, it's a huge client, but sometimes the way organizations are set up, they can, for example, they can justify developer hours. They can say, yeah, spend eight hours on this. And I don't know, let's say it's a hundred dollars an hour, it's going to cost you $800, right? And you go to them and you say, well, if we set up a tool, that tool is going to cost $400 a month, and it's going to save X amount of hours, um, unless you show them the specific numbers, they have difficulties dealing with that, because setting up a tool is some different accounting department, and they... Don't, it's not a line item they can pay for, and it gets confusing. So actually, the easiest thing to do is um, you pay for it, and somehow you pass on the savings to them. Having actual numbers is going to help a lot with that. Um, okay, so that's monitoring. Improving your world. Right? And this essentially means um, sending new features, building your world and then fixing it and sending new features there and so on. And that's what we used to do. We would click, 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 click. Done. And now do it again, actually on production. Or, uh, you know, you'd have features and you do click, 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 export, send it up, click a bit less. You're still clicking, and and we, yeah, maybe in Drupal eight we might stop clicking, um, or you actually you know you click click click, and then you do your feature and send it to GitHub, and then you have Jenkins or whatever um, tool you have that runs jobs for you, that is going to actually uh, take that code, send it to staging or production, clear the cache, um, uh, do um, uh, revert the features for you and all of that. Right? And you've saved a huge amount of time. So the way we quantified this is to look at the number of commits we have, group those commits because you don't actually do this on every commit, right? And then there's different styles of developers. So some developers are going to work quite a bit and then send everything up. Others will send every single change. Um, but you can kind of uh, group it by uh, a certain factor and say, you know, every 10 or every, or every 20 commits, that's an actual deployment. That's an actual sending code to staging or production where the developer is, is actively aware of it. Because obviously if you have Jenkins, on every single commit you are deploying. You know. But where this, what we wanted to identify is you know, the developer actually stopping and saying, I need to go make sure this is all fine. 
And if I didn't have Jenkins, this is the point where I would actually go and send the things uh, and test them. So you get a number of deployments, and then you check. What we're quantifying is how much time it would check uh, it would take you to check that things are actually where they're supposed to be, and they're largely working. And these are the numbers we got. So the, the commits are uh, 3,600 for the first one, 2,500 for the next one, and so on. And again, very, very optimistic, saying that in order to check validity, it would take you eight minutes without DevOps and just two minutes with DevOps. And again, the idea here is to take this framework and plug in numbers that are realistic for you um, and see how much time you save. And we just got like another week and a half of time because we did some simple things at the level of improving the world. So you get the idea. I will go through the, the rest a bit uh, quicker. Uh, testing, yeah. Um, what we do for testing now uh, in uh, most of the projects, not all of them, is uh, uh, BIHA tests for key scenarios, so it's not exhaustive, so there's a lot of space for improvement. And the way we quantified it is to say, you know, how many tests you have, the average time to perform the test, and the number of deployments. Now, the figures here are really interesting, and they just prove a specific point very clearly. So the assumption we made as we were thinking of the framework is, let's say that you're really committed. Right? You just don't have the tools, but you're really committed, and you're going to test anyway, even if you don't have the tools. So you define all your different scenarios. You send some code. If you're you know, really about quality assurance, you're going to go in and do all your tests manually because you have no other way. Or you have a tool that's going to run those tests for you. Um, and the point it proves very easily is if you don't have an automated to uh, tool, you're, just, you're definitely not ever testing. Unless you're spending 2,000 hours if you have 57 tests or 6,500 hours, if you have 108 tests on a project, um, you don't fool yourself that you're doing anything close to QA or testing or anything like that. You're just not doing it. Um, and this is on the basis that it will only take you 10 minutes to go through each test. And you know, uh, in, especially in the second case, th those are complex flows. Um, that uh, e-commerce related, and there's kind of a lot of different interacting components. So if you don't automate these things, you're just not doing it, period. Okay, then um, scaling. The, the last two are scaling and security, and these two are, are really, they can impact very much, but it's very difficult to quantify them. It's, it's truly, um, unless you're keep, keeping a very specific track of um, logs and you spend a lot of time to analyze the projects, it's very hard to identify how much time you spend on this, or unless you had like a huge issue. But you know, the way you would quantify this to say, you know, how many performance issues did I have and how much time did it take me to react? And we just plugged in some very uh, basic numbers and came up with results. Essentially, we're saying you know, it's going to take you about three hours without DevOps, and it should be much faster with them because you're probably doing auto-scaling or you have a, a way to uh, set up new servers just by, by running um, a specific uh, script. Securing, again, one that is really hard. Um, this is this this is our world, right? I mean, this is and and security is one that there is nothing you know. There's nothing you could have done for Heartbleed or Shell Shock. You just um, but at least if you have something in place, you can look cool while you're dealing with the inevitable problems. Um, and 
I apologize. It was his idea. <laughs> and the, the, the way we quantify, the, again, number of security issues, uh, average time to react. Uh, don't focus on the actual numbers. This is just something for you to take away and then plug in your numbers for your projects that you know much better, right? Um, okay, so you say you did all that. What would be the result? What comes out? Um, and we have the world view. So how much time you'd save overall? And again, this raises a very specific issue. Testing, and it's, it's, no, uh, it's no surprise that the whole um, move to Jenkins to start with, especially in the Drupal world, started when people really uh, were testing because there's just no other way to do testing, right? I mean, without DevOps, it's 9,000 hours. <laughs> so we, we actually took testing out to get something a bit more useful because essentially, as we said, testing without DevOps, you're just not doing it. Um, so you take that out and you see that you can save over three projects, of which one was really small, the others were, you know, uh, let's say, larger, medium to large projects. Um, you have, with very optimistic and kind of super efficient developers that are very committed and actually click real quick, um, you've still saved 260 hours. Now, 260 hours, you know perfectly well what value that has for you, right? Uh, so you can take that number and say, just over three projects, I'm going to save 260 hours. Um, is it worth me investing uh, to, to have DevOps in place? And if you take this to, to management and they're still not convinced... Get new management. Yeah, <laughs> pretty much. Okay, so to... <clears throat> sorry. To add um, another dimension to this, we also uh, did a small survey and sent it out and asked people to give us some feedback about the challenges they've had and so on. And I'll pass it back to the musician uh, to, to do the survey. I'll cop to that. <laughs> and so um, we'd just like to share a few of the most interesting results of the survey. And it's actually, it's been really great to have some of the long form responses that's kind of validated some of the thoughts we had while putting this together. Um, and, uh, and so it's obviously, it's not scientific, it's not a controlled random sample. Um, we send it out, we put it on the Drupal DevOps group, and we send it out in our Twitter account. So it's, it's pretty narrowly targeted at people who already have some interest in DevOps. But with that said, then we find that the results are interesting in spite of that, and perhaps even because they come from a group of people that are already interested in DevOps and what we see within that group. And so we find that only about a third of respondents are actually using a, sp a Drupal-specific hosting service. You know, we're thinking of things like Acquia Hosting, Pantheon, the Commerce Guys platform, things like that. Um, and so I suppose a lot of people there are thinking the market is open. Anyway, um, over three quarters of people of our respondents are using some form of DevOps practice. So it's uh, it's really out there. It's there. Uh, I mean, if you put that in contrast with or you know next to the results we had with our quantification framework, then you you might you can say. As a shop, if we're not doing DevOps, then we're getting behind the curve, and it's a competitive disadvantage. Um, and so when we're talking about <laughs> whether you do it or not, then certain shops are just saying, top down, that's it, get used to it. Um, we asked about people using third-party uh, continuous integration services, and that was quite low. Less than 15% of our respondents are. Um, that said, those that are are pretty bought in, so completely change their workflow for managing the deployment of Drupal applications, and I'm sure removed a lot of um, you know sort of boring time from their lives. <laughs> um, 
we asked, you know, did you have trouble getting in DevOps implemented? Did you uh, face pushback? And people said, really, not many did. Again, and this is a narrow sample. If you broaden this to anyone in Drupal that's tried to do something with DevOps, then that number, probably that percentage, probably grows a bit. But I mean, it's not that scary if you're there saying, thinking, oh, I, I, I really want to convince our leadership to take this on. Then uh, maybe it's not as hard as you think. Again, from Greg Nadison, he said uh, it went all the way up to the CEO and said he was resistant to automated testing and now accepts that that really does get him what he truly wants, even though the line item doesn't look like what he wants. And another respondent said that um, that they've really seen a significant percentage savings in troubleshooting issues, you know, having things like we talked about, <coughs> log aggregation and tools that make it easy to quickly narrow down to your real problem. And finally, we asked people about what were the biggest wins they saw, what really gave them the most bang for the buck when they were looking at different phases of DevOps and different tools. And the things that really stuck out that we heard again and again were configuration management, uh, automated deployment, and quick, easy scaling. Uh, and easy in the sense of not that it's necessarily easy to set up, but once it's there, you don't have to tinker with it. And so if you're wondering where to get started, and then these could be a good place to begin and start building institutional confidence in your process and what you're doing. And so that's really it for the survey. Um, thanks a whole lot for being here. And um, we'll just, we've got a few minutes for questions if anyone has anything they'd like to ask us. <laughs> Stunned you to silence, I guess. <laughs> so thanks so much. Uh, we'd really appreciate any evaluations that help us make, get better. Um, it's up there on the uh, DrupalCon site. So we appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. The biggest thing I see coming down the pike with Drupal 8 is the configuration management initiative. Um, features, it's, it's been a godsend in the sense that without it, then you, you have a whole lot of trouble really deploying anything configuration-wise with a Drupal site. But it's not what it was built for, and it has some you know, pretty significant limitations, one of the biggest being that contributed modules have to take the effort to integrate with it. It's not, it's not baked into the product. And so that's going to make a really big difference. Um, anything else in your mind? I think the one thing that is probably unexpected that will change with Drupal 8 is the way people build websites with Drupal period. And that's not going to come immediately, but because Drupal 8 allows you to decouple kind of the content management framework really from the, the, the UI that runs on top of it and is the Drupal we know, um, I think you're going to see that in one or two years after it's released, people are going to um, have many more examples and not be scared to build very different looking websites. And that's obviously going to have an impact on uh, how you test and how you manage these applications because they're actually going to be uh, uh, decoupled and easier to manage on their own. And I'll say from a deployment perspective, if all of a sudden you're thinking about things like headless Drupal and it's not, you know, here's this neat trick I did with Drupal 7, the dog standing on his head, all of a sudden it's really basic that you can build applications <coughs> that are more modular and so you might be easily doing, thinking of doing things like um, putting Angular apps that are out there in distributed data centers around the world and you're really seeing big improvements in your response times uh, because the code is closer to the customer, things like that. And like Ron said, I think people haven't really started to think through and imagine a lot of that stuff yet. And so there, there are big changes coming. Yeah. Do you mind stepping up to the microphone so it's on the uh, Thanks. 
Um, what do you think about having the developers, Drupal developers doing the DevOps, or having a dedicated person to, to do that, or persons? I, I really think it should be all of the above. And um, as I was saying a bit earlier, then the biggest piece we see is that it, sh it should be a culture and it's not, and you know, maybe you have one person who's really interested in it, that's their thing, and they do a lot of the implementation. But it should be a mindset that anyone's looking for areas to improve things that, oh, I just did the exact same thing 10 times in a row, this is stupid, you know? <laughs> Let, let's change that. And so that, that's what we really encourage is for yeah, everyone to have investment. Can I ask, so, did you look at any other monitoring tools or did you just pick one something that fitted everything that you were looking for? Or? Specifically New Relic? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, you advertised it heavily, so right. I don't like No, again, no relationship. <laughs> Happy customers. <laughs> We looked at a few, uh, but n I'm advertising it again, so it's your fault. <laughs> um, it, it integrates lots of different pieces of information really well, so it, um, it just made a lot of sense. Yeah. Well, I can, I can say that the alternative to it that we know about, and this could be poor research on our part, but is sort of getting a lot of tools, so like Greylog would be an open source log aggregation, but that's just logs and then um, sort of a good MySQL monitoring tool. Uh, you'd need one that can do stack level analysis that shows you sort of response times, what's taking the most time through the stack in different pieces. Um, the, it's, it's a good way to, to pay for a lot of things at once, basically. Cool. Thank you, everyone. Thanks so much.